are welcome to go via the bitumen. Or one of the things that we always do is we give a lot of advice to our participants who might be very unfamiliar with travelling. And so they might say to us, okay, I live in Brisbane and I would like to go to uh, Alice Springs to join your Simpson Desert trip. You know, what's the best way that I can go? So, you know, my response to that might be, you know, you can go by the bitumen if that's what you want. And that would entail driving up to Mount Isa, Camel Wheel, across to the three ways down through Tennant Creek that way, Stewart Highway, you stay on the bitumen all the way. Or if you're up for it, you can go via the gravel, which is becoming increasingly more and more bitumen. Uh, last time I did the Plenty Highway, uh, there wasn't an awful lot of bitumen, but I hear it's going to finally be, be all bitumen, which I'm not really fond of. But uh, if you want to go via the Plenty and you want some advice, just um, get in touch with us. There are some issues with travelling the Plenty Highway in terms of tyre life and so on. And if you're not in a rush, then we can help there. So if you've got any questions about travel or you've got any questions about tyre pressures or how you manage, um, you know, travelling in remoter areas or anything like that, then feel free to ask those questions. And um, so, as I said, Misty will be heading across by the Plenty, I would suspect, and I will be going by Port Augusta. We'll start our Simpson Desert trip um, 1st of June, and we'll be heading down the uh, South Road, and that's probably from memory just a bit before the Fink Desert Race starts, so we'll hopefully dodge most of the traffic for the Fink Desert Race, and uh, then head into places like Chambers Pillar, the Lambert Centre, um, I'll probably pop, pop in and say good day to some friends of mine in various places along the way. We'll then go down to Mount Dare and from Mount Dare across the Simpson Desert. There's an awful lot to see along the way. Um, then those who are doing the package tour, and if you're interested in that, we do a package of the Simpson and the Hay. Uh, so the Simpson trip is eight days, the Hay trip is 10 days, and you can do a two-day layover in Birdsville and do both of those trips. So now the Hay trip is an interesting one, uh, really interesting because it goes into the mouth of a river. So those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, there are five rivers that empty into uh, the Simpson Desert. I'll get to your question, Meg, in a minute. Um, the Hay, the Hale, the Todd, the Fink, and the Plenty. And um, those rivers all just peter out. You know, they kind of submerge under the sand and in big years they kind of make big lakes and so forth. And so one of those, the hay, you, comes down and, and sort of uh, just disappears. And we actually traverse up the desert and eventually end up in the mouth of the Hay River the mouth that empties into the desert. So it's a bit like driving into the mouth of a river instead of in a boat, you're doing it in a four-wheel drive. Some great scenery to see along the way, Lake Caroline, all these great places and uh, really fabulous camping along the way. So Meg has a question there and there was mention of needing, I think, at least 70% tyre tread for Simpsons. Can this be determined or estimated by glance or does it require an expert assessment? No, it doesn't require an expert assessment. It's really just a way for us to say that um, take a really good look at your tyres and, you know, at worst case scenario, they'd be um, 50%, but we kind of recommend 70% so that people will pay attention, basically. Uh, if you want to go and ask your... Um, your tire person, you can do that. But, um, you know, also the other thing that I would suggest you do is have a look at the age of them. So there's a few things about tires. And, Meg, you're actually coming on, uh, I think, the, the winner's tour, right? So that's not a crossing of the desert. It's a, uh, an overnight stay in the desert. And uh, get to Kerry Purcell there. Kerry, um, I'll get to you. And um, he wants to get a question about fuel. So try and, what I'm trying to say about the 70% rule is don't bring your rubbish old tyres, right? 
uh, and look at the, uh, the tread on them. And if you think they're really worn, they're probably not a good idea to take on this trip. Use them as spares for sure. You know, what I used to do is when my tyres got down about 50%, they would go onto the spares pile and I would use them as my spares. Um, so I was getting on to age of tyres. If you want to know how to check the age of your tyres, go have a look at the side of them. They'll be a little oval shape, sometimes with fake Phillips head screw heads uh, in a little tiny oval. It will have four uh, letters in it, the week and the year. So it might be 2616, which would mean in the 26th week of 2016, the tyres were made. Don't bring tyres that are more than about five years old. Six is what we recommend, but you know, five, something like that. Uh, six is what we recommend to replace them at, so don't bring six-year-old tyres. Um, you will need two spares for all of our trips. Now, you don't need two spare wheels. If you've got a, a tyre on a wheel, just bring a tyre. Uh, both Misty and I are quite capable of removing tyres from rims and replacing them. Uh, so... Yeah, thanks for that question, Meg. Now, Kerry has a question about how do you calculate fuel usage for desert crossings? Would doubling my highway usage be an idea or do you have other tips? We most certainly have other tips. Um, Kerry and I will send you that. Basically, the way it works is that um, the, the, the authorities, if you like, the people who give the permits to cross the desert have recommended minimum fuel quantities. And I'm probably going to mess these up if I get them off the top of my head um, because, as you, some of you know, it's uh, we're restarting this business and we stopped travelling in 2014, so I've got to go back to my notes sometimes to remember. But I'll give you a kind of a rough idea. You need about um, probably 140 litres for a six-cylinder diesel. And you will use... Uh, well, you need about 160, actually, because you will use somewhere between 90 and 145. Now, typically with my Nissan Patrol uh, six-cylinder diesel, I would use uh, about 100, 110 in a typical year, but one year I used quite a bit more than that. So I will actually send out in the packs, and if I haven't done that for Kerry, for you, I'll, I'll make sure I do that. It's also up on my Facebook page. For the V8 petrol that I took across the desert in uh, 2004, we carried 200 litres and we used 185. So you really can't use your fuel consumption figures to determine desert travel. You really just have to go by the recommended quantities. And um, let me just pull them up and see what I can find here because my memory's um, failing me. Now I've got it here somewhere, but here we go. So <clears throat> we typically do the trip in four days. So for uh, a large four by four, like a Nissan Patrol diesel, uh, 150, as I said, 160, expect to use uh, 100 litres to 125 litres. As I said, some people have used more than that. If it's unleaded, carry 200 litres and expect to use 130 to 170. For a medium 4x4, like a Toyota Prado, carry 140 litres, expect to use 95 to 120. If it's uh, petrol, carry 180 litres and expect to use 120 to 155. If it's something small like a Colorado, uh, carry 130, expect to use 85 to 115. If it's petrol, carry 160 and expect to use 110 to 140. If it's a tiny Suzuki Sierra or something like that, carry 110, expect to use 65 to 95. So I hope that helps you, Kerry, and others who might be wondering. But, yeah, you can't really go by the fuel consumption um, that you get on the highway and double it and things like that. It just 
doesn't seem to work. And the other thing to consider is you you actually need a reserve because uh, what can happen is you can get stuck um, and have to go back or exit through another route or or that sort of thing. And one of the reasons that you you might want to consider travelling with a group like us is not only do we give you that information, but we also go to the trouble of planning our trips so that we don't arrive at the fuel places when they're closed. And you might not think um, that's much of a possibility, but if you do the Hay River trip, for instance, and you just say, oh, look, we're going to leave Birdsville on this day and we're going to arrive, you know, X, Y, Z on this day, uh, and not give any consideration to fuel availability. Well, if you drive up the Hay River, you go to Batten Hill, you can't get fuel at Batten Hill, um, you have to go out to Javois, which is like 85 foot kilometres further out. When you get to Javois, guess what? It's closed on a Sunday. If you do the Canning Stock Route and you refuel at uh, Gunawarachi near Well 33, you will... Uh, have to refuel probably in many cars. In mine, I didn't have to, but many cars had to refuel at Villa Luna. Uh, if you arrive at Villa Luna, uh, sometimes you'll find that it's closed, like Northern Territory Picnic Day. So, you know, these sorts of things are the things that we've got a lot of experience doing and so we plan our trips so that you don't arrive at these places, you know, when they're out of fuel. Of course, we can get uh, caught ourselves. Um, and that's why, you know, for instance, you can have an emergency. We had arrived at Villa Luna one day and there was some kind of breakdown. We had to sit around. Well, the other advantage of coming with someone like us is, well, if you get stuck at Villa Luna, um, we'll have a night at uh, one of the many campsites that we know around that area, whereas I've heard people arriving at Villa Luna and not having any fuel, so one of the cars wouldn't go, so they towed it whatever it is, I can't remember now, 175 kilometres to Halls Creek. Uh, when I do that, we'll, we'll, we'll camp the night because our tour schedules are so designed that we're never in a rush. Even if we have, you know, like on our canning trip, we can have three days of trouble and we'll still arrive on time. Our Simpson trip, you know, we've never had to rush ever. And so that's one of the tricks in planning these trips is, uh, you know, how long does it take me? Um, and what we typically do is we add an extra day for every seven days of travel and we will turn that into kind of a go slow day or uh, on the canning we might camp uh, an extra night at, um, at Derva Springs or extra two nights we did one year, um, things like that so that we... If we need to use the time because things are going badly, then we can then, you know, use that extra day up. So if you're planning your own trips, try to do that. Try to, you know, I've, I've heard of people planning to do the, the canning stock route in, um, you know, 14 days. Well, we do it in 17. That's from Waluna to Billaluna. But our actual full canning trip is 23 days because it goes from the Stewart Highway across to... Carnegie and then across the Waluna and then up the canning. But the canning piece of it is 17 days. And I uh, saw a Tagalog tour operator come into Waluna one year. I won't mention any names, but we were about to head out because we do our trip south and north. And every single vehicle, including the tour leader's vehicle, had no shock absorbers left. And that comes from overheating them because you're driving too fast or driving for too long. The corrugations on the canning um, can be atrocious and the best way to do them is kind of walking pace, really. And if you, you know, I see people go, oh, you know, fly along the top. No, it doesn't work. Best way to do them is you know, like this. So, hey, we're going from well, you know, whatever today. We're going from well... Um, 30 to well, 35 today, that's as far as we're going. It'll take us all day. So we've got the time. Anyway, who wants to rush, right? Get out and take photographs while your shock absorbers cool down, all that kind of thing. 
Now, I notice we've got about 12 people in the room, but we've only got a, a couple of questions. I know, um, look, I know fuel is one of the things that comes up all the time. And uh, so thanks, Kerry, for that question. It really is a matter of just going, this is the number. You know, it's 150, 160 litres for my six-cylinder diesel, you know, Nissan Patrol. And I used to carry 220 because I could. Um, and, you know, for, so for the Simpson Desert, it's just a matter of doing that. The other thing is um, on your way over to these trips especially, you know, so if you're leaving somewhere and going to where our trip might start from, whether that's Birdsville or Alice Springs or somewhere else, don't ever go to camp where fuel is available without fueling up first. So in other words, you arrive at a, at a campsite where there's fuel and you say, I'll get my fuel in the morning. Don't ever do that. Don't ever do that. Um, you might not get any fuel. So, you know, go and go and fuel up, come back, do your camp. Um, I also know that tyre pressures are something that comes up an awful lot and um, that's something that we will help you with on our trips, you know, how to manage your tyre pressures properly. And, um, you know, on the canning especially, uh, but in the Simpson too, too many people drive with too high tyre pressure. And to be quite frank, um, I've never had to do a sand dune twice in the Simpson, um, and that's because of tyre pressures. So the rule of thumb that I use is I should be able to drive up a sand dune in first gear or second gear low range, typically in an instant second gear, but I should be able to go up in first gear low range at just where the turbo is cutting in, so like 2,000 RPM, something like that, and not wheel spin. And if I wheel spin, my tyres are too hard. And I did this one two years in a row actually to show people. Uh, there was a fellow actually at, um, at the base of Big Red one year and he was complaining that he couldn't get up. And um, he said, you know, I said to him, well, you know, you need to let your tyre tires down and he said I've let them down and I said yeah 28 psi right and he's like how did you know so I can tell by looking at them and he said uh, they were 42 so I have let them down and I said well let them down to um, um, let them down to 18 start there I don't know I'm not letting them down that much so what I did was I said okay mine are at 15 uh, and watch this so I got in the Nissan Patrol, I pulled the mechanical throttle out, set it on 2100 RPMs uh, after I put the thing in gear. Let, so first gear, low range, let the clutch out. Don't do this. I was showing off clearly, but I was trying to get the point across. I said, I'll show you how much skill's involved. I opened the door, stepped out, stepped onto the running board and steered through the window and drove up Big Red while standing on the running board when I got to the top of Big Red, I reached in the window, switched the key off, got on the radio and said, there's how much skill you need to drive up Big Red. What you need is tire pressure. Okay, fearless walker, what's the most common mechanical problem encountered in your trips? Okay, the most me common mechanical problem is tire punctures, but I'll get on to some other things as well. Tire punctures happen because... People are driving on sharp gravel roads or gibber plains like between Mount Dare and Pernibor or the Gibb River Road or the Plenty Highway where there's um, a chert, which is the rock that Aboriginal people made their stone tools from. So if you're driving on those kinds of roads with your tyres too hard, uh, you'll puncture. So you need to drop your tyre pressure about 20%, so about 80% of what you would normally have the map for the road. And I can teach you more about how you do this with actual numbers, but um, uh, um, we might get a question about that and I can talk about that later. But um, So you drop them about 80%. And then the trick is, if you have your tyres at 80% pressure, you have to drive at 80% speed. So if we take your top speed at being 100, which is a nice place to start, nice round number, then don't go over 80. 
So if you're driving the Plenty Highway or the Gibb River Road, then you shouldn't be doing more than 80 kilometres an hour and your tyre pressures should be about 80% of what they are on the road. Then you won't get so many punctures. The punctures are a bit like a, a really hot, uh, pumped up balloon hitting a needle. If your tyre is soft, it will wrap around. And people say, oh, you get sidewall punctures. Sidewall punctures are rocking horse poo or chicken teeth. They don't happen. You know, they happen if you drive up on a sharp rock, you know, on, a, on an embankment or you run over a great big stick or something like that. They, they don't happen on the road. The sidewalls fall apart on the tyres because you got a flat and you drove on the flat while it was low pressure. What other mechanical problems? I've seen it all. Um, uh, refueling from drums comes with its own danger. You should uh, bring, uh, on a trip like the Kenning, if you're using a petrol car, sometimes you'll have to refuel out of drums. You should um, use, and I, I often bring them, some kind of sieving device to sieve the petrol out. The best thing to do is actually, um, you know, have a, a funnel with a whole bunch of, you know, stocking or something in it and fill through that. Um, other mechanical problems that we've seen are uh, electrical. Common things are electrical uh, items breaking down because of vibration. Um, on that point, and antennas falling off bull bars. Um, so if you uh, have a UHF radio fitted to your vehicle, and especially if you have an alloy bull bar, don't buy stainless steel whip antennas. Buy those nice, big, fat broomstick-style antennas. Yes, they're expensive. They're expensive for a reason. If you have already got a stainless steel antenna mounted on a bull bar, especially an alloy bull bar, then what you need to do is bring along some plastic tubing, the clear tubing that you can get from, you know, the big green hardware store. Uh, make sure it fits over the, the antenna on your ball bar. You know, often they've got a little uh, loading device in the middle of the antenna, the bit of stainless steel, then there's a fat bit, and then there's a bit of stainless steel. Make sure it fits over that, and um, that will stop the sinusoidal waves developing in the antenna on the corrugations and will stop the antennas breaking. Um, so that that's very common. I, I would say 10% of our clients' vehicles lose their antenna in the first two hours of the trip. I do carry spares, but I'm not going to carry a stack because they are expensive. Um, I do carry a lot of that clear plastic tubing, and if I see a stainless steel antenna, I'll go stick a bit of that tubing over the top of it. Um, other mechanical problems, look, I want to answer that question a bit more before I go on to Meg's next question, um, Phyllis, because one of the things that I do, and I'm going to give away a little bit of a secret here, is I filter out the vehicles that are highly modified and suggest that they probably don't come along. So if you've got a vehicle that um, you know has six inches of suspension lift or or classic case, you've got a petrol 80 series Land Cruiser that now has a 6.7 litre diesel Cummins engine and a seven-speed Allison transmission, uh, I'm probably going to say, yeah, oh, we're all full. Uh, because they those conversions, those modifications are the things that break. So let me clarify that for a second. You're not going to break a Cummins engine. You're not going to break an Allison transmission. What you're going to break is the oil cooler that wasn't installed properly. You're going to break the um, the turbocharger is going to fall off the top of the engine. Had that happened, had the oil cooler break, all these kinds of things. The 80 series with the uh, 6.7 litre diesel had been converted from petrol. The people had spent $30,000 doing the conversion and the people who did the conversion didn't change the fuel system over so I had the wrong type of fuel system for a diesel. So I had to do a, a bush fix in the middle of the canning stop route to solve that one. So um, you follow that vehicle all the way through the desert. That the one, that, <laughs> is that the 80 series you're talking about, John? Yes. Um, so 
I, I, I just uh, that's a good story, so I'm just going to talk about it for a second. And I and I'm, I'm no disrespect to the person who brought the vehicle along, he's a lovely fellow, and we did solve all his problems. But on the Kenning, the thing would not start up every every time it stopped. So we would stop the smoker, you know, taking out to get it started. We stopped for lunch, taking out to get it started, and I couldn't work out exactly why initially. And then I decided, all right. I said to the fellow, don't switch it off. Just just leave it running all day. Switch it off at night time. And he didn't do that. So one lunchtime or morning tea, he switched it off and it wouldn't start. So I said, okay, time to sort this thing out. So I lifted the bonnet and had a look. And for those of you who are technical, it was a petrol converted to diesel. And what had happened was they'd left the original fuel system in. So what happens is, and I won't go into the technical side of it but what happens it was the fuel was siphoning back to the tank so we had to stop that happening we did that and he was fine after that but uh yeah john i forgot that you followed that vehicle because he did uh, the simpson triple a trip or something with us or maybe both as well um so yeah modified vehicles not a good idea um they're nowhere near as reliable as the manufacturers because the manufacturers did lots of r d so meg's got a question um oh hang on let me just think for a second about other things shock absorbers on the canning in particular you know if you're going to do the canning um make sure your shock absorbers are in good condition i use conies i use coney 90 series can't always get them for things like prados so you go down to the coney 88 series or the coney 82 series if you have to um that's my preferred brand you might have other brands but um shock absorbers on the canning in particular um that's about it for mechanicals i think meg has a question do you recommend any particular devices brands etc for checking tire pressure and adding air okay so um i will be carrying compressors for a number of compressors for clients to pump their tires if you wish to get your own then i would recommend uh, there's a dual headed version i think it's called thumper or thumper max or something crazy like that um let me have a look there are many versions of this but thumper max it's called yeah uh, not particularly cheap, but if you want to buy your own, then buy something like that. There are 300 litres a minute, um, which is not terribly big by, you know, uh, workshop standards, but that's the kind that I carry. Now, once again, you don't have to bring your own. The beauty of bringing your own is it does speed up the reinflation process, but um, I will have several compressors, but between myself and Misty, there's probably going to be three compressors. Um, so the Thumper Max, though, or that style of thing, um, a dual-headed compressor, so it's got two pistons, uh, is my preferred way to go. All I would say to you is don't go and buy the little cheapy little plastic one because it will melt the first time you use it because they're not designed to pump four tyres up. So while we're talking about that, we typically um, deflate. I'll talk about the, the trip that you're coming on, uh, Meg, because it will make more sense to you. We go down the south road out of Alice Springs, about a few kilometres out of town, we deflate a little bit. And then we drive all the way down to Mount Dare and into the desert and then we'll then when we get to the French line, that's when we deflate further. So for your trip, we're unlikely to get that far. We will probably go to the Colson track or somewhere like that, which if you've got a map you can look at. Um, and we will not need to deflate seriously for that. We will be deflated somewhat, and if we need to, we will deflate further. But typically we don't do that till we start into the serious dunes, which is a little bit further along. Um, so when we come back to um, Mount Dare, we're likely to be able to reinflate there. 
or if we have to deflate a lot, we'll reinflate somewhere around about Perny Bore or somewhere like that, um, which we'll do with our own compressor. So you won't have to bring one, um, although you should be um, you should be carrying a spare tire for your trip over, particularly if you intend to drive on gravel. Um, for checking the tire pressure, just just buy one of those digital tire pressure gauges. If you're going to get really serious about off-roading and you want to, you know, build up a kit of good stuff, um, that's a different story. The ARB style uh, pressure gauge that removes the stem from your, sorry, removes the valve from the valve stem to allow faster deflation. I carry one of those. Misty will be carrying one of those. I actually carry several of them. Um, and I share them around so people can deflate faster. Uh, if you're really serious about equipping yourself, you might think about getting one of them. Um, there are cheaper brands of the same thing. If you want to check out, you know, type up ARB tire deflator and have a look at it and then try and find similar ones if you want to. I can't vouch for the quality of the others, but, um, you know, there are plenty of them out there. But that's really not necessary. If you're coming along on my trip, we've got all the inflation stuff and all the um, things that you need. But it is very handy to have one of those digital um, tyre pressure readers. Um, I find them quite reliable, more reliable than the ones with the little stick that's, that pokes out, um, like my father used to use. Uh, so, yeah, definitely you could... You could get yourself one of those digital tire things. And as I said, if you want to get a compressor, just don't buy one of the cheap ones, you know. Um, buy something that's going to do the job. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so that's tire inflation, tire pressures, and so on. There is a little way, you know, that you can work all this stuff out, by the way, which I do teach my people in my towing training. Um, if I get the time, it depends how much time we've got when we're training. Uh, but particularly if you come and do the off-road training, uh, towing training, then you'll get taught this. But we, uh, the way to calculate tire pressures uh, for any situation is to know what your car weighs and then interpret the information on the side of the tire. Um, so if you want to know that we'll teach you that when you come on tour with us but basically it's a matter of your tire has specified a maximum pressure and a maximum load and they're written on the side so i'll give you i'll give you an example if i can think of numbers that actually work um i have to pick these numbers out of my head i guess let's say the tire says the maximum load is um 750 kilos just pick a number and um the Maximum pressure is 80 psi, and they're written on the side. So this is uh, obviously a light truck tire I'm talking about now. Then if your car weighs um, 1,400 kilos, no, let's say twice that, 2,800 kilos, um, then we'll just assume for the moment that the load is equally spread on the axles, which means you've got 1,400 kilos on the front axle, 1,400 kilos on the back axle, which means you've got 750 kilos per tyre. Um, that means your pressure needs to be 80 psi. But let's say you do the numbers and it works out to be half that. Then your tyre pressure for the road this is, the highway, needs to be half of that plus a safety factor. So half of 80 is 40. And if you do, if you get a light truck tire and you fit it to a typical four-wheel drive, that's around about the number you're going to come out with, somewhere in that 35 to 40 psi range. Um, and the safety factor is four psi, so you add the four psi on to whatever you, number you've calculated. So let's try that from the top. Whatever load you work out to be on your tire, which is the car's load divided by four typically, you then divide the maximum pressure by, by, that, by that. So if you're half of if you're half of the load, then you need half of the pressure plus four. If you're three quarters of the load, then you need three quarters of the pressure plus four. 
if you're right at the maximum or the plus four takes you to the maximum, then you use the maximum, but I would recommend you get a different tyre. And that's your on-road pressure. And then for off-road, we use a footprint method, which I'll talk about if you come on a tour with me. But if you want to, um, you know, calculate the number, gravel roads where you're likely to get a puncture, 80%, sand dunes, 50%. They're your starting numbers. So that's the kind of uh, guidance that we can give for tyre pressures. But as I said, we use a footprint method, and if you come on a tour with we, me, we'll, um, we'll describe how that works because we can't do it without the car in front of us. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, tyre pressures, mechanical failures, fuel, and I'm uh, just wondering if anyone else has any questions, any further questions, uh, either about our trips or what's raining here or about anything else. And, um, you know, just go ahead and ask us a question. Uh, maybe something to do with setting up your car or maybe something to do with um, one of our tours. I will say that we did say to those who are coming along on the on the women's tour that we kind of took the blanket rule that we apply to all of our sense of dirt crossings, which is we don't commit um, trailers on our on our sense of desert trips. And there's a, a whole bunch of reasons for that. And I won't go into all of them. But I have rescued more cars with trains out of Simpson Desert than anything else. And um, but for that women's tour, if you've got a proper off-road trailer, uh, and by proper off-road trailer I mean ask me and I'll tell you if it's a proper off-road trailer. Don't ask the person who sold it to you. Um, we will permit certain types and designs of trailer. And um, we will get that, we'll allow you to bring that. So I'm talking about the ultimates. I'm talking about, you know, serious off-road trailers. If it's a trailer that someone told you is off-road and it's got leaf springs and slipper springs and whatever else, it looks like a box trailer with a tent on the top. Sorry. No. Uh, because you will, it will break. You'll be disappointed. Uh, everybody else will be disappointed for you. and It'll be a whole sad affair. Thanks, Meg. Um, yeah, we're hoping our training gets going again soon as well. We do have towing training planned for, oh, let me check. It's supposed to be Brisbane um, last weekend, but of, of course that didn't happen. And Dubbo and Tamworth. So Dubbo is on the 18th. This is for towing training. And Tamworth on the 19th. Brisbane on the 25th, which of course won't happen. And uh, so Sydney, I think, is probably going to open up. I suspect it's going to be October before Sydney opens up in Canberra similarly. So, yeah, I yeah, thanks for that. Well, hopefully our training will get going again. So while I'm waiting for any other questions, if they occur, briefly the schedule for the next year again, as I said, was Simpson Desert from June 1 to June 8, uh, eight-day trip, Alice Springs South to... Chambers Pillar or Titicala first. Chambers Pillar. Um, Titicala has a wonderful art gallery, by the way, if we can get into that, and I've checked that they will be open. Um, follow the old Gann Railway Line, which is really, really interesting and exciting. And when is the Dubbo training, uh, Kimberly? Uh, Dubbo training is fully booked um, at the moment for the 18th of September. Uh, Tamworth is fully booked for the 19th of September. The next session in Dubbo is the 20th of September, uh, 20th of November, and next session in Tamworth is the 21st of November. We don't have any other training planned for the year, but if things persist the way they are, and um, you know, we we are struggling with COVID still, but regional New South Wales has opened up. I might try and organise some extra sessions for Dubbo and Tamworth. And if I do that, they'll likely be located somewhere like Yumundjeri uh, for the Dubbo training and Kerr Lewis or somewhere like that for the, for the um, Tamworth training. Now, the reason for that is 
there's only certain dates available for my venues and the venues are very expensive to hire. So um, I'll try and use alternate venues if I can. And, uh, okay, if November works out good for you, then get, um, if you haven't already, let me know, then then let me know. I think you might have because I recognise the name. But, um, you know, get in touch with me via the site and uh, we'll slot you into a, a date. Now, off-road towing, is it off-road towing? Uh, we're presently conducting on-road towing. Um, if you want uh, off-road towing, we, we can essentially tell you what the dangers are and, and that sort of thing. We don't have an off-road venue right at the moment. When we get uh, an off-road venue, we can we can take you through some things, um, actual the actual driving, but we'll try to simulate that at our at our on-road venues if that makes sense to you. So we'll cover all the things like tire pressures, we'll cover all the things like how do you recover a trailer if you get stuck, um, you know how to analyze whether or not you should even drive somewhere off-road if you've got a trailer, that kind of thing. So um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. So while everyone's thinking about any other questions that might have it, I'm going to sort of pull this up very shortly. Um, since the desert, I was talking about down to Old South Road, down to Old Gand Railway Line, which is really, really interesting and exciting to think uh, from Fink, or oh, sorry, to Tichikala before the Old Gand Railway Line, I said, then down the Gand Railway Line to Fink. From Fink, we go into the Lambert Centre, which is um, the geographic, or the the centre of mass of Australia, down to Mount Dare, Pub Meal, great times, fabulous, um, down to Dalhousie Station and Dalhousie Springs, a nice warm swim in the 40-degree uh, spring, back into vehicles, off to Pernibor and probably beyond because it will depend on the availability of firewood. Um, then four days across the desert, seeing all the wonderful things there in the Birdsville. If you're doing a combined trip, two-day layover in Birdsville, then we're back out to Pebble Corner. From there we head north up to a place called Beachcomber Well, follow a shot line towards the Northern Territory Queensland border, GPS navigation till we intersect the Hay River, run along the side of the Hay River. You know, by about day six we're at Lake Caroline, which is a, a salt lake right in the middle of the desert. Um, back out to the Hay River, day seven, I think it is, six or seven, we're in uh, Batten Hill. Uh, the traditional owner uh, that we used to meet there, uh, a fellow by the name of Lindsay Bookie, uh, who passed away in 2013 while our tour was at his place. Um, I believe his extended family is now running that operation, so hopefully we can go and do a a bush tucker tour with them. If not, I can show you around the bush tucker. And then out to the Jervois and then along the Plenty Highway to Bullia and then Bullia to um, Diamantina, Diamantina, La Quarrie, into Winton and a fabulous night. We have, always have an amazing night at Tattersall's when we finish off. Um, the publican there is a fellow by the name of Paul. And every year that I go in there, he's just so wonderful the way he treats us. It's really, really good. We have a big celebratory dinner in uh, in there. Then I jump in the four-wheel drive and Misty and I go back across the Plenty Highway. We arrive in Alice Springs and we greet you all for um, the women's tour. So eight days travelling, all women. We go down the south road again, Mount Dare, into the desert for a night, back out, up to Old End Dado to hear the story of Molly Clark and and then wind our way around to um, the beginning of Len Bedell's uh, Gun Barrel Highway, uh, staying out of the uh, closed lands, particularly with COVID, uh, and then up to uh, Uluru, where I kind of have to hand you over because they're very restrictive about who can operate in Uluru. Uh, so you go Uluru Kata Judah, and that's where we finish. But if you want to, you can come back out with me to the highway and back up to Alice Springs with Mr. Your Me. I might head south to Sydney. We haven't worked it out yet. So that's the schedule for um, for next year. The following year, we're still trying to work out what we're going to do because 
we were planning to do a canning, but um, I think there's a possibility that the canning will still be closed. So we'll work all that out and, um, you know, see what we're going to do. Maybe we'll do a Kimberley or something like that instead. Anyway, thanks, everybody, for your time. It's been a half hour, so I think that's plenty for people to um, to take in. Actually, it's probably an hour it's been. Um, and um, I just want to thank you all, those of you who've booked training with us, been on training with us, been on tours with us. Um, think about going on tours with us. Thank you all for your time. Check us out on Facebook. Subscribe to this YouTube channel. And uh, let me know if you want another Q&A or whatever. Otherwise, send me questions in Facebook and um, we can address anything that you want to talk about there. Facebook, message me there. Uh, particularly those of you who are coming on trips, if I've kind of provided information to you and you feel like it's not answering your questions, like Kerry with respect to the fuel quantity, get in touch and we can answer any questions. And I uh, hope that was good. Thanks, everybody.